So I think that's uh, all the admin matters, non-physics matters. Um, what I wanted to do for most of today was just uh, um, just uh, uh, drawing some free body diagrams. I, I've done some additional examples in the past. You see them, um, uh, I think last week, you saw them linked from this uh, chapter six reading and lectures page. And uh, let's see, where did I do it? Uh, yeah, addition of free body drawing examples. I think I meant to do more, but I kind of ended up with just uh, the two that's uh, here. And wait, do I have really only the two? Uh, no, no, so there's two here, and then there's one here. And um, I think it's worthwhile to do more, because uh, as I say in the introduction to standard strategy, the step that takes most effort and kind of analytical power is that first step of drawing the free body diagram. The rest of the steps, even though they seem more mathematical, once you get practice into it, it will be um, almost automatic. Uh, you know, defining coordinate axes, breaking down forces, writing down Newton's, third, Newton's second law equations. Uh, those are all kind of automatic things once you get practiced in it. But it's in the drawing free body diagrams where even I sometimes miss some force if I don't pay careful attention. So, um, so I think that practice is worthwhile. So I'll do more examples. Um, so yeah, this is a good example. Um, and uh, so I guess I will answer the question for the as it's supposed. I think there's a yeah point A, and and I can do a couple additional points for fun. <laughs> so uh, I, I guess I should have copied the whole question, but let me just briefly describe. I don't remember the whole question, but I do know that the question was about as this roller coaster passes through this point A. Uh, what are the forces on the uh, on the cart or the child? I mean, it's basically the same thing, but through the free body diagram of the child. Okay, let me do the child. Um, so this will be the uh, child with a uh, cart around it or something. Uh, good. So, so let me draw a free body diagram. Um, I when I draw a free body diagram, um, and when you draw a free body diagram, this is what I would recommend. Um, I try to draw the simplest possible diagram. And at this stage for us, that means uh, we are representing the object with a simple dot, because um, we don't really need any other details to um, to indicate forces on on the object. Uh, later on the, in the semester, we'll be using more extended um, uh, representation, but that's when we are having to deal with the torque and rotation. So um, with that object of the child. So as you're thinking about what forces are on the child, um, I think the single big, um, single most useful thing I can tell you is this uh, kind of uh, context-dependent hint which is that in this class, almost all the forces you are dealing with are contact forces. There's really one exception, that's gravity. So, oh, so there's gonna be gravity on the child. So let me draw that. So there's uh, gravity pulls the child downward. So there's a downward force on the child. And, um, and again, as I was saying, <laughs> the biggest thing I can give you is that all the forces in this class, other than gravity, are contact forces. So whenever you are identifying a force, you should be able to identify something that's touching the object in order to exert that force. So you think about what object is touching the child. Well, um, I guess this roller coaster car is touching the child. You know, this roller coaster car is touching the child. So for this uh, surface of contact, um, you can think of, well, whenever you have a surface you're dealing with, you either have force that's, a, or you either or, or both an end, <laughs> uh, force that's perpendicular to the surface, you have normal force, and you might have forces that are tangent to the surface, that would be the friction force. So here, um, you should have normal force. The question even describes the child feels pushed into the uh, seat. And so the seat must be pushing the child back. 
So I look at the surface and normal force has to be pointing away from the surface. So the normal force will be going in this direction. And as you draw these forces, I encourage you to ask this question. Did I draw all the forces and uh, only the forces that I need to draw? And oh, and, and maybe you, you could also be thinking of if there might be some kind of friction force going uh, in the direction parallel to the surface. And as you're asking the question, did I draw all the forces and only the forces you need to draw? The main thing that you would look at is your intuitive sense of direction of acceleration, because that's a, really the, um, the kind of the first line check. Your, the direction of your net force should be in the direction of acceleration. And, and that's what this makes uh, this question the hardest because um, this is where a lot of people, their intuition will say that acceleration here is equal to zero or something along that line. Um, it doesn't, because the child is going in a circular thing or someone might think, oh, maybe acceleration goes this way or this way. And the correct direction for acceleration for this particular motion is uh, this uh, direction. That's the direction of acceleration for this position of the child. And that's because this is the centripetal acceleration. I think you spend more time with this scenario this week. Uh, this week is the second week of Newton's law applications when you are spending time with the circular motion. And um, the number one thing to remind yourself that when you're dealing with the circular motion is in a circular motion, even when the speed is constant, uniform circular motion, there is always acceleration. And the, and the direction of that, it, it, when you have a uniform circular motion, direction of that acceleration is centripetal, meaning center seeking acceleration. So, so, you know, with this uh, information in mind, I'm thinking, oh, so I guess I don't really need the friction because uh, I don't really need the horizontal acceleration. So let me get rid of friction. I don't really need it, at least for now. And um, I have both the normal force and weight pointing downward. And my knowledge of circular motion says the direction of acceleration should be downward. So, so. So yeah, that should be, um, so it looks like I have complete free body diagram. The d direction of the net force that I would get from these two forces matches the direction of acceleration that I would uh, expect from my knowledge of the setup. Yeah, so th that's it for the question as it was posed. Let me um, answer a slightly modified version of the question, which is kind of interesting and exciting and that, uh, also kind of means complicated, which is why I didn't ask that particular question. Um, so, you know, this is one particular location in this circular motion. Let me imagine the child is, I don't know. Um, guess you can imagine a bunch of different locations. Um, I, I think the location that would be, I, I was saying B, but B is a little bit, maybe not quite, um, Different enough from A, so let me uh, find a kind of different enough uh, from A position. This position here, kind of at 90 degrees from A. So I can ask the same question at this position C, what are the forces on the child? And I can review this diagram that I've already drawn and consider what changes I need to make to it. And so uh, I'll, I guess I can start from my favorite starting place, weight, gravitational force. So I would ask the question, during, throughout this motion, did the, the gravitational force on the child change? And the answer after thinking through it for a bit, it should, it should be no, because the gravitational force is, uh, it's the interaction between the child and the earth. and nothing <laughs> that going on with earth has changed. So this weight shouldn't have changed at all. So you still have this downward force of gravity. And uh, I'm continuing to look at, okay, um, so what other objects are touching the child? 
there's the car still. Now the surface of bottom surface of the car is here. So if there's a normal force like I was drawing before, that would point away from this surface. So so I need to change my direction of normal force. It's going to point to right instead of uh, directly downward. So this is my directional normal force. And you ask the same question again as before. Did I draw all the forces? And and I think this is kind of the challenging question because, again, as I'm answering the question, I'm usually asking myself, what does my intuition tell me about the direction of acceleration? And if you're thinking that your intuition tells you that direction of acceleration is this way, you know, centripetal, um, you'd be right to the extent that, yeah, that is the centripetal direction. Um, but but you know when you look at this this diagram then it it does like a distance for direction of acceleration it doesn't work it actually looks like the direction of acceleration is at some oblique diagonal angle and the truth here is again this is an interesting exciting complicated setup uh, you don't have just the centripetal acceleration because frankly this is in a uniform circular motion at this location here the child is actually speeding up um, and so there is a component of acceleration parallel to the uh, direction of motion. There's tangential acceleration. So you could kind of break down these motions into axes and say the normal force is providing the centripetal acceleration and the gravitational force is providing the tangential acceleration and analyze it that way. Um, but so this is the more kind of the complicated scenario. and. Uh, in for our part, when and if we want to deal situations like this, we'll use a different set of tools that we are going to be introducing in about two three weeks. Um, the Newton's law strategy kind of gets complicated with the curved tracks like this. But uh, but even so, you should still be able to draw a free body diagram, and with the practice, you should be able to get a kind of intuitive feel that this is the correct free body diagram. And the where practice comes in. Uh, let me just reread the question to make sure. Through the free body diagram of the mass moving the circular path is shown. Okay. Um, yeah, let me do this in two parts. Uh, so I'll, I'll first do it in, um, in the first part with the position of the mass as it's shown. And then... Um, I'll explain a process that we go through when we are dealing with a circular motion. Like one of the standard question you see this week will be what we call banked turn question. And in those scenarios, you always have to pick some kind of a snapshot. So, um, and I think this is an excellent opportunity to kind of describe it. So let me do that. So the, the question gives you a picture. It gives you this, uh, a mass that's uh, um, tied to a string, nailed down in the set, what becomes the center, and it's moving in a circular motion. And I guess uh, for simplicity's sake, we'll say this is a frictionless table, or it's an ice cube, or whatever. <laughs> so it's uh, um, going in this circular motion frictionlessly, I guess, forever. So it says draw the free body diagram. And the picture shows you a perspective view. And whenever you have a perspective view like this, I would recommend that you redraw it um, into a kind of a view that shows a straight kind of a view. The thing is, the perspective views are nice for you to get a sense of what things look like. It's nice for building a mental image, but um, it's uh, not so nice for drawing vectors with an unambiguous direction. So, so let me draw a free body diagram. And, and I think when, with this scenario, there are a couple different views you can pick. And uh, let me first draw a free body diagram with the side view. So this would be the free body diagram side view, uh, by which I mean I'm imagining being an observer who's kind of looking at this um, looking at this table just to, from the eye level. And from that perspective, if I'm imagining looking at this cube here, then 
let me represent it with the simplest possible representation of that. And, um, and, and I should draw forces. Uh, when you see some objects that are quite obviously exerting a force, you might want to draw it. So I see there's a string here, which must be applying a tension force. So let me draw the tension force in the direction of the string. That's one. And as I'm looking at this object, imagining it from side of view, hmm, I have a saying, there's always gravity. And I haven't, it looks like I haven't drawn gravity. So let me draw gravity so that I'll know that I haven't missed something and that I can kind of see if I've drawn all the forces. Because that's the question you should always constantly be asking while you're doing step number one of standard strategy. It's quite easy to miss a particular force and kind of go down this rabbit hole of not being able to solve the situation because you either forgot a force or you put in a force that shouldn't even be there. So as you're doing that check, you know, asking yourself the question, did I draw all the forces? Uh, what you should look for is does the, what looks like my net force, you know, sum of all the forces, does that match the direction of acceleration that you intuitively know from the setup here? And I think this net force is wrong for one reason. There's, it's showing a downward acceleration where I'm pretty sure there shouldn't be downward acceleration because it's on a table, it's not digging into the table. And that's hopefully when you realize, oh, there should be a normal force that's countering this gravitational force. And in fact, for this scenario, it should be equal to mg, although not for every scenario. So don't just jump to that. <laughs> so I'm looking at this and I'm again asking myself the question, did I draw all the forces? And here with the forces drawn this way, I can imagine my acceleration pointing to the left. And that would be the question to ask. Um, is this acceleration consistent with what I expect from this situation? And the answer should be yes. <laughs> you know, this kind of, this uh, takes a little bit of time for you to build up that intuition. And what I would ask you to is remember that this is a circular motion, uh, possibly uniform circular motion if it's moving frictionlessly. So in this circular motion, there is always going to be centripetal acceleration. That's really the hardest thing about the circular motion, that it forces you to expect acceleration where you might not be used to uh, seeing or thinking of what you see as an acceleration, because a lot of us come in with this uh, um this intuition where acceleration is a synonym for speeding up and the way we use the word acceleration in physics, it's not same as a speeding up whenever your velocity vector changes, either in magnitude, which would be speeding up, or in direction, it's a acceleration. So, so that's a really the hardest part to anticipate this centripetal acceleration and be comfortable with this free body diagram that gives you this uh, left toward the or, uh, left toward the tension that it that should be there, so that this uh, cube undergoes centripetal acceleration and is kept in this uh, circular motion. Um, so that's uh, one free body diagram we can draw. Let me just uh, draw a free body diagram from a different perspective, and I think. Uh, both the perspectives are valid in some sense. And I think seeing them both on one page can kind of show you what one view shows and what the other view maybe uh, shows better. But um, uh, so, you know, they have both pros and cons. So this was the side view, which um, has one good thing about it that I will <laughs> mention after drawing the top view. So, uh, so I was saying that when you have a perspective view like this, you have to make some kind of a choice. So I, before I chose the side view, imagine I'm uh, looking at the table edge on. So the other choice is 90 degree from there. Imagine you are above the table looking down. So I'm going to say my free body diagram, this time for the top view. 
And uh, I guess for this view, let me just leave this mess where it is uh, for now. Then um, I have the mess where it's, uh, I represent the mess with a dot as usual, simplest possible representation. And and I, I guess, you know, if this was a correct free body diagram, then all these forces should still be here. I'm just rotating it around. So I should still have tension force more or less pointing to the left. And um, so from this view, if I'm drawing the normal force, it should be a vector that's pointing towards me, towards my eye. And we do have a convention for that. Because um, when you have only a, a two-dimensional plane, for that three-dimensional representation, you do need a kind of a convention to represent something that's pointing into the screen or something that's pointing uh, into the screen or out of screen. So um, something that's pointing out of screen, we so that would be our normal force here. We represent that with a circle with a dot in the center. It, it's supposed to um, remind you of a tip of the arrow that's pointing towards you. So that's the normal force. And from this view, I have a gravitational force that's uh, uh, pointing into the screen or pointing away from me. So that's my gravitational force. Oh, and <laughs> the convention for vector like that is a circle with an X in it. It's uh, supposed to remind you of the other end of an arrow. So arrow has an arrow tip, and the other end has a kind of feather thing that helps stabilize it. So uh, you, it, with the circle with the X, you're imagining looking at a feather thing at the tip. So do that to the top view. And so for this uh, one snapshot that you have, um, in some sense, the side view shows these vectors in a more clearly separated away without needing to introduce new conventions. Um, there's a, one thing that this top view does do well, uh, which is that, which is connected with the fact that this is a uniform circular motion. So this, uh, unlike other scenarios, this block doesn't really stay at this position. It's moving and at some point it's going to reach a different position. So when you imagine the forces on this block at a different position, then uh, this side view changes in a way that um, the change in the version looks nothing like the original one in this snapshot, like the tension force will be now pointing towards you. And um, the top view here, it changes rather nicely. You can just uh, take this. And can I rotate it? I think I can rotate it. You can just rotate it 90 degrees, and there it is. That's your free body diagram. <laughs> the vectors that are either pointing towards you or away from you, they still point towards you and away from you. And the one centripetal force that was pointing to the left, oh wait, pointing to the left, now it points downward as it should from that view. So, so when when you're dealing with a circular motion, often you will, um, or when you see me dealing with a circular motion, especially this week's problem solving videos, um, you will see me often uh, choose a snapshot as a first step so that I can draw this side view in a more concrete way. Because oftentimes it's the side view that has the necessary information. And for the top view, the snapshot isn't really necessary, but you know, once you have a snapshot, then <laughs> might as well use it. I think I want to do this one, um, question 11, just because I think it's different from the ones I've done before. And it's a good scenario to illustrate uh, what I call Newton's third law check. This is one of those questions where um, it can uh, surprise even some experienced people in the sense that sometimes people forget to do certain things. Um, my goal in uh, this demonstration right now is to kind of uh, show you what to watch out for so that um, so that you have more confidence as you are working through this, that um, when you have drawn all the forces, that uh, you have drawn all the forces, and if uh, there's something missing, then uh, and, and then you, you have the tools to spot whatever it is you may have missed the first turn, time or so uh, let me look at the question to make sure I understand the, the friction. So it says, yeah, there's a static friction between the blocks and uh, this surface is frictionless. 
So I'll have that information in mind as I draw the free body diagram. So when we draw free body diagram, our recommendation is to draw two separate diagrams. I know sometimes there are different conventions. There are textbook authors who will just draw arrows on this and maybe even use the surface as a place to attach the force vectors to. I've seen that and I can see some justification for it so that you are thinking about where the force is coming from. Um, and you know, and you know, if you are following that alternate convention, I will recognize it and not mark you as so wrong just because you're doing things a little bit differently. Uh, having said all that, that really isn't what I recommend because I think, uh, especially at this stage, there's a uh, more value in drawing a clean, clear free body diagram that uh, whose purpose really is to help you, um, do the Go through the standard strategy, you know, write Newton's third law, Newton's second law equation in the fourth step. So for that purpose, really what's useful are the simplest possible free body diagrams. So to make the diagrams as simple as possible, you should really draw one dot for one of the objects and a two second entirely separate dot for the second object. And when I draw them, I almost deliberately don't geometrically arrange them in the way they are in the physical space because they are two separate diagrams. They don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. Um, yeah. So, so with that, um, let me start drawing forces. <laughs> Whenever the question tells me that there's a force on something, I like to draw it because it's uh, nice to be told what to expect, and I should have kind of used that information. Just to move this up. So I have F um, apply the force that's going to be on block M1 at this angle here. So let me just draw that. And if you want, you can uh, draw some hints on the angles that are given and this sort of thing, just to make sure that you can clearly see what are the force vectors and which are not. Um, Okay, I've drawn the applied force, and um, and I'm asking myself this question: Did I draw all the forces? And as you're asking the question, one of the easiest thing to get is gravity. Um, most of our scenarios deal with while you are near the surface of the Earth, so there's always going to be gravity. So let me draw that gravity that's always there. It's uh, for me, it's most useful as a starting place. Because it's uh, really hard to stare at an empty page and keep asking yourself, did I draw the forces? And the, often the answer is, I don't know, it's empty. I have no idea if uh, that looks uh, consistent with the real world. And once you've drawn some arrows as a starting place, then you can ask this question, are the pictures you have drawn consistent with the reality? As in, the force vectors I've drawn here tells me that my acceleration is pointed that way. Does my intuition about this setup agree with this supposed direction of acceleration? And I hope your answer is no, because as you're looking at it, you can kind of guess intuitively that any acceleration has to be rightward. So that tells me that there must be some vertical force on M1 that's, uh, not, that's stopping it from accelerating downward. And there is, and that should be the, normal force from this surface of contact. You have the surface contact between M1 and M2, so there must be a normal force that's uh, pushing it up. And I have a sense that I'm gonna get a lot of normal forces, so let me label this N1. And, oh, wait, sorry, one second, I forgot V here. I mean, you know, something that I'm gonna remember is I'm <laughs> writing down Newton's second law equation, but might as well fix it now. So, as I'm staring at this free body diagram, if I'm think, uh, oh, and I guess I might as well also draw normal force on M2 because I do kind of know M2 cannot be accelerating downward. That doesn't make sense. So I see, oh, there is a surface of contact here. So there must be a normal force from that on M2. So let me draw that as well, M2. And again, I ask myself this question. Did I draw all the forces? 
And with the mass M1, if your answer at this point is yes, um, that might be okay for now. <laughs> I'll come back to that. But I hope as you are looking at the free body diagram for M2, that, um, that something looks wrong to you, that it looks like you are missing some force. Because um, the question said the, the friction force here is a static friction force. And what that means is that there is no relative motion between M1 and M2. Uh, it, it, so if M1 is accelerating to the right, M2 must be accelerating to the right with the same acceleration so that they are moving together. So as you're looking at that, and I don't have any right word forces. I must be getting it somewhere. And 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 the first time you you face a scenario like this, it might take you some time. Totally fine. Spend the time. Uh, make sure you are not drawing uh, this force on M two because it's not acting on M two. It's acting on M one. So don't draw that force on M two. Um, the only thing that could have possibly pushing M two to the right. Uh, of the two things that are touching it, the surface uh, below and the surface above, is really the surface above, one that has static friction force. So there is a static friction force on M2, and you need to draw it. There should be, uh, wait, I'm trying to pick a color. Actually, let me go with red. <laughs> there should be a static friction force that's pushing M2 to the right. That's where its acceleration comes from. Now, as you're looking at these two diagrams and you're asking yourself, did I draw all the forces? And if it looks like you have, um, I don't blame you. It kind of looks complete, you know, here I can get rightward acceleration, here I can get rightward acceleration. So what am I missing? And uh, this is where I am uh, telling you about this thing that I think I that was in the lecture. Uh, what I like to call Newton's third law check. And this time I do mean third law, not second law. So Newton's third law is the law of interaction that says when object A pushes on object B, then object B pushes back on object A. So what I mean by Newton's third law check is you need to look at every single one of the forces on your diagram, and you need to be able to answer this question. Uh, uh, these two set of questions. Uh, first question, is it an internal or external force? Uh, as in, is it a force that's exerted on the body from some other object outside your system? Uh, that would be the external force, and if the answer is yes there, then, then you're done. With the external forces, there's nothing more you need to do. If it's an internal force, then you need a second follow-up question. Where is your reaction force pair? So, so that's the check that I need to go through. I have six forces here, so let me just go through them one by one. I have gravity. Um, I'm asking, is it an internal or external force? Well, where does gravity come from? It's coming from Earth. It's the Earth pulling it. Earth is uh, not uh, my system is this, mass M1 and mass M2. That's my system. So Earth isn't part of it, so I don't, so it's an external force, I'm done. I have this applied the force. Is it an internal or external force? Um, well, it's an outside agent that's doing whatever the problem says it's doing. So, so it's an external force, whatever that outside agent is. We're not drawing uh, his, her, it's a free body diagram. So, um, so, so no, no, um, so that's an external force, no reaction force needed. Now I'm looking at this N1, looking at this normal force and asking, where is this normal force coming from? It's coming from this surface of contact. So it's M2 pushing M1. So I need to have a reaction force pair on M2, and I don't see that. So 
that's what I forgot to, I need to draw that. So there's a reaction force pair. And as I'm drawing the reaction force pair, I like to label it with the same label as my action force, because that's really the main information you get out of Newton's third law. That's a Newton, Newton's third law says, well, it says these are two in opposite directions and that they have the same magnitude. And since they have the same magnitude, I can just use the same label. Don't need to switch it up. So yeah, that's one action reaction force pair. Or you could have actually swapped them, but I think most people get this end one before you get this end one. So, um, so let's keep going. I have three more forces I need to check. So this force, you know, if I check it again, then uh, that's my reaction force pair. So they are, they are paired up. We are good. This uh, gravity, external force, I don't need to worry about it. Um, and this uh, friction force, so the, the friction force is coming from this surface of contact. So what's pushing M2 to the right um, must be M1. That's the object that's touching it at that surface that's providing friction force. So I need to have a reaction force pair to this friction force on M1. And I don't see that, so let me just draw that. And I hope as you're drawing this, this answers to some question that you might have had. You know, question of what difference does M2 make in the motion of M1? Because I think intuitively you would feel that uh, as you are pushing M1, if uh, uh, M2 needs to move as well, then the presence of M2 matters. But up until I drew this friction force, nothing in this diagram depended on M2. And once you draw this friction force, then you see that's how these two objects interact. That's how M2 affects how quickly M1 can accelerate through this force of interaction between them. And, and all of this, so, you know, it's a, this is kind of the remarkable thing about standard strategy. Um, you don't have to kind of uh, reason through this interaction thing like in vacuum. Uh, in, you don't have to insert it as some uh, ad hoc thing. Uh, it just uh, comes naturally into it out of Newton's laws that you're going through. Uh, last uh, and two, oh, that's a normal force from this uh, table surface and table is outside object. So this is an external force, no reaction force, no reaction force pair needed. So we had these two action reaction force pairs, uh, this uh, set of normal force and this set of friction force. And uh, with that, now this is a complete free body diagram. The forces draw kind of, you can arrange them in a way that it gives you the acceleration you intuitively know you should have. And I've done this Newton's third law check. So I know I haven't drawn any action force that's missing its reaction force pair that should be part of the diagram. So, so yeah, and it, you know, it's in a situations like this when if I forget to do the Newton's third law check, I, I have actually forgotten some of these forces in a more complicated setup before. So I uh, do strongly uh, recommend that uh, you get into habit of doing this whenever you are dealing with a, a multi-body system. Whenever your system has more than one object, then uh, make sure you go through this check. And, 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 you know, there are more complicated scenarios where once you start involving strings and police. So, so, so when you see those scenarios, practice. So I think that's all the questions. Um, can you say that N1 is equal to W1? Very good question. No, you cannot. <laughs> so let me draw, uh, let me skip to uh, step number four. Uh, and write down Newton's second law equation to show you why you cannot. Uh, that, that is a very good question because a lot of people kind of assume that they are in situations when they are not. So I'm going to use these axes, x and y. And for the purpose of answering this question, it's the y direction that matters. So let me just write down Newton's second law equation for the y direction on mass 1. So I have upward normal force, N1, uh, minus I have downward gravity, M1g, and I have this. That's why these two are not equal to each other. I have minus the vertical component of this force, which will be F sine theta. That's equal to zero. So if I solve for N1 here, it will be M1g plus F sine theta.
So yeah, it's not uh, normal force. Normal force is one of those forces for which we don't really have a formula. Uh, the same goes for the tension force. Th these are, um, I guess, best one word or uh, one phrase description is a constraining force or constraint. Uh, these forces are there to enforce a particular geometry constraint. So normal force is there to really ensure that this happens, that any acceleration is parallel to the surface. Um, in the scenarios where surfaces themselves don't accelerate in a perpendicular direction. Um, but, or I guess in a more generally applicable way, normal force is there to ensure that the object doesn't dig into the surface. That's what it does. And um, so, so when you are going through the standard strategy, uh, don't usually, please don't assume what the normal force is, but write down this equation and the equation will tell you what the normal force must be so that your situation works out the way uh, it ought to work out. And yeah. Assuming there was no force acting on M1, then sure. Um, and uh, let me ask you this question. What would this N2 be equal to? If uh, So let's just uh, imagine this scenario. F is equal to zero. Then would you say that this N2, different object for this mass M2, would you say that this is equal to M2G? And I hope once you go through the standard strategy, then yeah. So once you go through the standard strategy, you know, write down the vertical component of forces, uh, Vertical component to two, then you have N2 minus N1 minus M2G is equal to zero. Solve for this. N2 is equal to N1 plus M2G. And I think sometimes people might have enough intuition to figure that normal force from here should be enough to uh, kind of bear all the weight above it. If you have that intuition, that's great. I don't. Um, want to discourage people from developing that intuition. But what I would ask you to consider doing in addition to that intuition is to go through this practice of uh, almost rigid problem solving. It comes down to this. Uh, you will see situations where you don't have an intuition for that particular situation. And when you face that new situation, you have never seen it before and you, your intuition fails you. Uh, what do you do there? The strength of the systematic problem solving approach is that even in situations when you have no intuition for, you know something to do. And hopefully as you're going through that systematic approach, you can, that can be an opportunity for you to further develop your intuition instead of intuition being the start and end of all your problem solving. So, so yeah, you, you can definitely say the weight of one plus weight of the second is the, this combined normal force, but um, it's a kind of a shortcut that uh, I would ask you to consider not taking at this time while you are practicing standard strategy. <laughs>